Dysfunction is happening at such a younger and younger age as well. You know, we're talking about things that are absolutely key at that level of charge, electrons, protons, flow. And now all of a sudden we've got kids who are indoors uh, with screens more than ever around Wi-Fi all the time. And so I think that is why we're, we're seeing more and more disease at a younger age. I think a lot of people would be angry about this. I was taught, right, that like, okay, the only way we get protons into the mitochondrial inner membrane space is we eat food, go through these really complex chains and, you know, we ultimately deliver those protons there. That cannot be the only way it happens, right? This is Decentralized Radio. I'm Tristan. And I'm Ryan. The goal of this podcast is to help educate you on how to live your most optimal life. We will host industry expert guests to shed light on topics that matter. We are not gurus, rather two individuals who have had to pave their own path to health and vitality, independent of the centralized systems that plague modern society. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Decentralized Radio. Today, we have Carrie B. Wellness on the line. Carrie, how's it going? Thanks for joining. Doing great this morning. How are you guys? Fantastic. I think, yeah, this might be our earliest podcast, Ryan, but it's fun because (laughs) it's very on brand for what we're going to talk about, or at least in general here. So I got my garage open waiting for the sun to rise and maybe 30, 40 minutes here. Ryan is very red in the... Basement? Yeah. Are you in the basement? Yeah, or... I'm just in the I'm just in the basement. I had to make a makeshift thing happen because everyone else is just now probably waking up. So yeah, I'm yeah. hoping that with the red, they'll kind of like stay out of this room <laughs> and just like, or they'll come in and wonder what's going on, which often happens. I had someone freak out uh, the first time I started using the red light. I was hanging in the bedroom and they saw red under the door and they're like, "What's going on?" And I was like, "Just using the red light." But you get it. Totally, totally. Carrie knows. Carrie is a quantum health educator and clinician, one of the yeah, OGs, I guess, and puts out a lot of great <laughs> content. So it's been fun learning from you, and now we get to dive into this. And it was kind of not a challenge, but it was like, oh, what do we want to talk about? You know, we only have an hour. So Ryan and I decided it would be awesome because I think it fits very well with some other podcasts we have um, talked about is – Yeah, kind of getting into the, you know, quantum communication of our body. And that starts with, you know, the collagen, water, matrix, connective tissue. And this is something I think you discuss and and talk about very well. So why don't we get into it then, you know, starting kind of at the top, you know, what is connective tissue and fascia and kind of how do we define these terms? Because it can get a little complex and there's a lot of names out there. Yeah, right. And I think that's why um, a lot of people don't view our body having like a system wide communication system that's not the nervous system or not happening through the circulatory system. And it's because you hit the nail on the head, Tristan. We call it the fascia, maybe when we're in the fitness world and we're looking to do some myofascial release. Um, we might call it the connective tissue, you know, maybe the chiropractor will say you got some tight connective tissue. And what it really is, is it is a a protein substance, right? Really collagen rich that we can feel like we can palpate, right? The side of the, the side of the thigh has the IT band. That's pure connective tissue. Um, but it actually branches and gets smaller and smaller and finer and finer to the extent that it literally goes between every cell as the extracellular matrix, another name that's more of a sciencey name for it. And it goes all the way through the cell membrane and into the cell. And inside of the cell, it forms the architecture of the cell that kind of gives the, the cell a part of its shape, uh, how it forms its shape. And that's called the cytoskeleton. And then look, it goes even further, right? It goes all the way into the nucleus where our DNA is, and it's called the nuclear matrix. And what I never connected, the dots I never connected just kind of in studying biology in undergrad was the fact that this was an interconnected web. And then I added on my understanding of water and really the quantum behavior of water in the body. And then I was like, holy cow, this is an entire communication network that is water-based. And I really want to give credit where it's due that uh, Dr. Jim Oshman, who is a biophysicist, 
he really highlighted this for me um, in one of his books called Energy Medicine and Human Performance. And it is, he calls it the living matrix because it legitimately is just like living and, and it always kind of changing. The fascial network can always change. It's a dynamic system that allows intercommunication at the speed of light, which is really, we have to, which is how we have to view this, the body operating. We, we operate way too fast, way too complex to really talk about the biochemistry being the dominant communication pathway. No, yeah. that actually makes a lot of sense. Well, I was going to jump in right there is like you, you sort of like uh, highlighted that and we, you kind of mentioned it as sort of being the super communication, uh, super communication highway. Sorry, it's a little early. So my, my voice is like warming up. I didn't do voice exercises, <laughs> um, which I'm actually told to do. But anyways, um, I, I never really thought of it in that sense, because I think like what you explored sort of in your solo podcast when you talked about it is everyone views the collagen matrix or collagen as sort of that kind of white nasty tissue that you clip away when you're doing surgery to get at a nerve or a muscle or a bone and not as what you call the super communication highway. So why, and you, you sort of alluded to this a second ago by saying that you're sending reactions that like the speed of light are even faster and everyone thinks of uh, a reactionary thing, whether it's in the nervous system or in the brain as sort of like a chemical response is how a lot of our medications are derived or to sort of assimilate or mess with those different chemical balances that to cause reactions. But I've never really thought of the body as being electrical until maybe this last year. And that was like a super huge brain explosion for me of knowledge. So let's talk about the super communication highway. Like why do you think that collagen and water, that matrix is so important for that? And what's the issue with chemical reactions? Like, is that too slow? Yeah, Which, well, ke yes. chemical reactions are, are too slow, right? Like the biochemistry I was taught was that you have to, this, this chemical diffuses and attaches to this enzyme and, you know, in actuality, the body lines itself up and all biochemical reactions are is an exchange of electrons. So that's electricity also. And so the reason why this, this communication superhighway, this connective tissue superhighway is so essential is because it is what allows us to funnel electrons and light as well, right? At the, you know, instantaneously, protons also. So we're really looking at what's happening in the exchange and the movement of protons and electrons and light communication. And so we have to view this connective tissue as like a fiber optic cable, right? It's 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 what really allows data. I, for me to send you an email, I could type up a whole entire email, click send, and you're going to get it halfway across the world instantaneously, right? And so that's the same thing that's happening with us. We use light and electrons and protons as communication mechanisms. And this is our fiber optic network that we can send it to anywhere in the body. And so to understand really how that operates, I think we have to understand the special characteristics of the water that surrounds that connective tissue, because that really is what dictates the, 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 these capabilities that I'm describing. Yeah, and you kind of just yeah previewed what I was going to ask next is yeah what's so special about this interfacial interfacial water biological water that is different from the water we drink? Um, how is this uh, kind of structured in a, in a specific way? And and people know the term I think you know easy water fourth phase of water, but there's even more of a deeper dive that we could get into. And yeah, I guess provide an overview because I don't think we have talked about that much yet on the podcast. Sure. Yeah. I love water. It, it was really what connected the dots for me, right? The connection between water and light and electricity. Um, and so the water inside of us is different than water in a glass because the H2O molecules arrange themselves in a very structured way. And so everyone knows, right, this might have been fourth grade introduction to chemistry, right? Everyone knows a water molecule is, has one oxygen and two hydrogens. And I think from then on, we just assume everything that we says has water is that same molecule and behaves like water in its liquid state. So when I was learning that the body, you know, undergrad, the body is, you know, 60 to 70% water and certain tissues like the brain and the blood, even more water. But when water in the body is comes in contact with a biological surface, the technical term is hydrophilic or water loving surface, which is the entire connective tissue network. It is the cell membrane. It is all the proteins. All of those are receptors. All of those are water loving. And so when water and in its H2O form, because mitochondria produce that water, yes, we can drink water in that, you know, in, it, in its kind of typical unstructured way, we would call it. 
when water comes into contact with these biological surfaces, it organizes itself. And instead of the H's, H2O's kind of randomly assembling themselves, like you would see water in a glass, if you were to look at it at that deep level of the molecular interactions, it's fairly random and it's, and it's changing, you know, but water in our bodies, the H2O's organize themselves into what we think the best, the best analysis is we think is in a hexa, in hexagonal sheets. So picture the H's and the O's actually forming honeycomb linkages where the O's are at the vertices, the H's are in between. And this happens next to all biological surfaces. And what makes this so unique and key to the quantum communication pathways is the fact that water, when it organizes itself this way, it's been coined by Dr. Pollock, exclusion zone or easy water or fourth phase water, and it's got a charge to it. It's negatively charged. It's electron rich, right? It means it's got electrons in it. And any connected linkage, right? Any system where there's, um, where there's connected molecules and there's, they're doped with extra electrons, those electrons no longer just stick with that one water molecule, right? Those electrons are now freely mobile and can move throughout the entire continuity of the network. So now all of a sudden, if I need electrons, to maintain cellular charge, right? Electron voltage maintains cellular charge. That's a key aspect of health. I can funnel them throughout this network. I'm designed to pull them in in various ways, like through my feet via earthing. Through, you, you can actually uh, energize it through sunlight. So I'm just designed to, uh, I can get it through movement, right? My connected tissue actually can make electrons for me. And as I'm gathering electrons in these ways, I have a, a way to funnel them where they're needed in the body. And so I can uh, maintain cellular voltage I can funnel them to the mitochondria where the mitochondria can turn them into more water plus ATP, which helps the proteins function at their best. I can funnel them through chemical reactions. I mean, I, 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 they can act as an antioxidant, right? And, and really help my body to calm inflammatory species like reactive oxygen species that happen through natural metabolism. And so once you realize that this water is negatively charged and is an interconnected network that can funnel electrons everywhere, it made perfect sense to me that this is so fundamental to us being able to operate so quickly because you have this movement at the speed of light happening and it can happen uh, anywhere in the body because the network is a super highway. Yeah, that's in it's incredible, I guess, when you realize how wa water, yeah, it's just so fascinating to me and, and has these quantum characteristics. And that's a good way to put it. I never kind of thought it's like that's the actual path for the electrons. I mean, we talk a lot about grounding and we've both written about, you know, the zeta potential in the red blood cells, like needing to have sufficient negative charge to repel each other, to prevent coagulation, things like that. So I guess that, yeah, makes a lot of sense to me and, and hopefully that makes a lot of sense to listeners. But then people are probably wondering, you know, how do we maintain sufficient charge in the EZ, um, in the zone, the exclusion zone? And, yeah, what are things that are contributing to that? And then also, I think, you know, the term is exclusion zone. So it's excluding things. How is that a, a benefit as well from, you know, say external toxins? Sure. Yeah. Great, great, child. great questions here. So like, first and foremost, this exclusion zone water, um, it's while it forms instantaneously next to biological surfaces, it, it's dynamic, right? So it, it can get, it can, it can shrink, but it's meant to then charge back up and it can shrink and charge back up. And what charges it is infrared wavelengths of light that charges it the most uh, um, profoundly. And unfortunately, what did we do to modern light bulbs? We removed the infrared. What did we do to modern window glass? We eliminated the infrared from penetrating into our, our environment to make it energy efficient. Um, and so now you can imagine that if we're really um, trying to charge this infra or the, uh, this exclusion zone so we can funnel electrons and, and, and we're trying to charge it back up with infrared the way we were designed to, it's not happening in an indoor environment, at least not anywhere near to the extent that it would be happening outside. Because outside, sunlight is always approximately 40 to 50% infrared, meaning naturally, you it could be the middle of winter, right? And you actually are getting infrared, even though you're not feeling it as heat, you're getting infrared from your environment. And so um, what I'm seeing a lot is that people are really depleted in what I'm going to say in this exclusion zone water. So that impacts this communication highway. It impacts things like cellular voltage, because that negative charge is what maintains cellular voltage. Like in, in more technical terms, cells need to maintain an, a cytosol, a, a gelled water state inside of them 
at about negative 20 to 25 millivolts. And so that's just an electron rich environment. And as we get, as we deplete, 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 the cell has to decide, oh, okay, we don't have enough electrons to run these reactions. So what are going to be the essential reactions that we have to maintain? What are the ones that can go? But like, you know, p- picture never, ever maintaining that charge inside of the cell. And all of a sudden you're running on like a cell phone that's at 15% battery or something. You know, what, what happens? You, you can't download a video. You can't use your flash anymore. You know, so the body does the exact same thing. But we have a hundred thousand tasks happening inside every cell every second. Imagine all of a sudden being like, oh, those 50,000, sorry, they got to go by the wayside, right? You can you can understand how we can start to accrue cellular damage and cellular dysfunction um, simply because we're not maintaining this exclusion zone water. The other way that we can also maintain the exclusion zone water or at least support the charge is, as you said, through earthing. And so it's really cool to see the before and after pictures of those red blood cells, you know, bef- and, th- and that red blood cell, zeta, that zeta potential, that's exclusion zone water. The outside of a red blood cell is a hydrophilic surface. And so you can see when we're disconnected from the earth, we it shrinks, it diminishes, the red blood cells clump. It's the perfect um, image for people to see. And then as we go ahead and we earth outside and, and we get the electrons in and we are under the infrared light, you all of a sudden you reestablish the exclusion zone and now you can, uh, you know, pull in oxygen and deliver nutrients, take waste away. Um, it, it just makes perfect sense. And we're just living so disconnected from how we were basically designed. We're di- designed to be connected 24 seven. We have some capacity to store this charge, right? A little bit in, in the membranes. Like we have, we have electrostatics in the body where we can store it, but not, not massive amounts of electrons. We can store fat, Right. But, you know, we, we never had we never had a need to really store this exclusion zone water because we were always in nature. And so that's why we have to be outside regularly and recognize its importance because it's an essential factor in how the body functions. And we're just not replenishing it the way we were meant to be, you know, replenishing it. Hey, friend. Thanks for listening. If you really enjoy this podcast, it would be really appreciated if you left us a five star review on Spotify, Apple or subscribe to our content on YouTube. This helps us get to a larger reach and a larger audience to spread this wonderful free education. That's some really good points, actually. And it makes me think about a lot of stuff. That's why I like if I talk to anybody that's like a night shift worker, for example, they're kind of screwed because it's like one, you're under the wrong type of light all the time, mostly, I mean, pretty much 100% of the time, because there's no natural light at night, really, unless it's like you're getting a little refraction from the moon, which is nothing. And then you're inside, and then you go home, you go to bed, you sleep all day, there's no light, but it's completely circadian mismatch. And so you create all these problems there. But it makes me wonder, because there's, there's a lot of practical things that I have people do or that I do myself, like I'm using the red light, with, which has some infrared light coming off, obviously not as good as the sun. The sun's like the ultimate light. I tell this to people all the time. They're like, oh, should I just get a red light? I was like, well, if you get in the sun, like, it's going to be a bajillion times better because the sun is, you're never going to emulate that. Um, you mentioned infrared sauna and things like that as well are, are pretty practical and like grounding and all these various things. But to me, in, in the back of my head, when you have someone that's dealing with a lot of problems, and this is sort of a open-ended question, but when you're dealing with someone that's really sick, that's really depleted, they've dehydrated themselves so much over long periods of time, they've damaged their collagen, which we can kind of get into various ways that that happens with glyphosate and various stuff like that, where replaces the amino acid, which is really interesting. Um, how does somebody like begin to catch up and then sort of undump this bucket that is constantly overflowing? Because I know people that seem to be doing all the right things, but they just, they can't seem to catch up. And maybe you have some sort of um, insight into that, having worked with people yourself and also maybe just with yourself, like there's obviously practical things we can do every day, but how do we catch up, especially when we just are set up to be screwed. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a great question. And I always, I like the phrase in quantum biology and quantum health is redox before you detox, meaning build up your charge. And that charge is this exclusion zone water. So what are the things that are fun- fundamental? I think are going outside and touching the earth. If you can with bare feet or bare hands, bare skin, um, especially in the morning, cause that supports circadian signaling. So that just basically optimizes timing in the body and every cell runs on timing. So if we can get outside, first thing in the morning, that's great. Then we have to really be aware of all the things like that you alluded to that destroy and deplete this water 
inside of us and damage the the highway, if you will. So what creates like roadblocks and bumps in the highway? Um, unfortunately, Wi-Fi, right? All of these non-native electromagnetic frequencies, com- they not only diminish the exclusion zone itself, but they also impair the mitochondria's ability to make water. And so it's like that's kind of like our, our cellular hydration replenishment, right? We funnel electrons to the mitochondria, they make water for us and ATP and, you know, the, it, it gets stru- restructured. And so we're, we have this con- continuous flow. And when the mitochondria can't do that, they actually make more reactive oxygen species that zaps extra electrons and extra charge to kind of calm it down. And so it becomes a vicious cycle. And so we have to be aware of our proximity and our use to, uh, to wireless devices. And so, I mean, my, my, like my fundamentals for people on that are get stuff off of your body, right? Like if you have something emitting Bluetooth that is physically on your body, or if you have a cell phone physically on your body, it's very chaotic and dehydrating and depleting. So like, that's, I think a bare minimum, Um, but then paying attention to how do we need the Wi-Fi on in our house at all times? Can we unplug? Can we hardwire things? Like it took, you know, it took me a while to get to the extent that I'm hardwired. Right. But I think it's an important an old school, but important thing to kind of go back to. Um, and so that's just be aware of that. Blue light is another one. Blue light jams up step four, where the mitochondria make water, cytochrome C oxidase. And so what unjams with that blue light? red and infrared frequencies near infrared specifically and so right so right ryan right now right you're allowing your mitochondria to really freely make water um going outside would do the same thing because while there's blue light coming from the sun there is an abundance of red and infrared that allow those mitochondria to, to freely make water and so that's where artificial light comes into play turn your lights off There's no, there's really no need, right? Can you open a window? Can you turn your lights off? Um, I do understand that there's people in an office space in cubicles and things like that, but that's where things like maybe mitigating with yellow tone blue blockers comes into play. Iris tech on the screen if possible. So there's, there's ways that you can be aware of your, your artificial light exposure, but especially at night, at night, it's so dysregulating that artificial light. So that's where the orange tone blue blockers come into play. And those are really foundational. It's like get outside, touch the earth, especially in the morning, front load the morning if you can, minimize your exposure to wearable technology, block and mitigate the artificial light. You're going to at least give your body a, a, a good chance at that point so that when you do things like full body sun exposure, extended earthing, red light therapy, sauna, then you're allowing your body to essentially build up adequate redox or adequate charge to detoxify. Because as you asked earlier, Tristan, it's called the exclusion zone because the only things that can legitimately penetrate into it are electrons and photons, right? And phonons. I mean, it's an antenna. It, it, can, it, can, it can attract information, frequency from the environment. But physically, toxins should not be able to penetrate through it. It can't. And so someone who is, has intracellular toxicity, to me, it's a big indication that they've not maintained adequate exclusions on water. And instead, they've got more of this bulk water, this water that doesn't have any structure to it. And the toxins are able to lodge themselves intracellularly, which what does that do? it makes the mitochondria dysfunctional. And so the mitochondria then can't make water as well. So it really comes down to setting the key redox strategies and then maybe something like a sauna, a red light therapy panel will then be able to push you past that boundary where you feel like you've been stuck. But a lot of us are just kind of spinning our wheels just in because we think maybe 20 minutes of earthing is not enough every day when we were designed to be connected 24 seven. Yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So many good points there. That's like fascinating because I think this is more important than ever because one, we're more disconnected than ever. And two, we're exposed to more toxins than ever. And people always bring up these points of, you know, like blue zones and centenarians and whatever. And sometimes they'll be like, Oh, she smoked cigarettes. till she was like a hundred or, you know, there was, you know, they're drinking alcohol and, and things like that. And I, I just think of, yeah, exclusion zone water as well as like circadian health like if they're if they're like a farmer who was always rising with the sun setting with the sun outside all day connected you know the the alcohol the the whiskey and the cigarettes probably yeah they're probably not going to be doing as much damage as someone who's living in a city working nine to five and that's important right that's a way you can build resilience so then it's like yeah these 
mountains of toxins we're exposed to aren't going to do as much damage. But then simultaneously, yeah, people always ask, you know, how much grounding, you know, how much sunlight do I need? It's like as much as you possibly can. Like literally, I just to me, even working like in a garage and being outside, not every hour I possibly can. I'm like, ah, you know, missing opportunity there because it's really it's so important. And I think people still can't grasp that importance, but it's hard in a modern lifestyle to really, to really prioritize that. Or yeah, like you're saying, you might work in an office or just be limited in some degree, but it's really so fascinating. And, and something else that I've read recently about and may when Ho's work and Emilio Del Giudice, I think is how you say it. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not Italian. So, well, partially, <laughs> but it, it's, it's a challenge you get into. So we talked about electron flow and kind of how the matrix um, facilitates that, which is extremely important. And then the other side of the coin is protons and this proton water chain that forms um, and, jump conduction and then we can get into maybe like coherent domain water but maybe you can explain how this proton water chain works and why that's so important in this uh, structured water yeah sure and so when that when you have a biological surface and the exclusion zone forms in order for it to be negatively charged because water as a molecule is just h2o is just neutral right The, the positive and the negative charges balance each other out And so when you form this negatively charged exclusion zone, in order to make it negatively charged, you have to kick out a proton. And it turns out that that proton just lines up right next to the exclusion zone. And so biological surface, negatively charged exclusion zone, and now you've got this proton zone, which is being termed the proton wire. And depending on where it is, it has a couple of different capacities. For example, picture the exclusion zone that forms inside of a blood vessel where you have the the, um, endothelial lining, right? That's a hydrophilic surface. You have the negatively charged exclusion zone. And then as as that exclusion zone forms, protons are ejected. And what those protons actually do in that capacity is they vortex the blood. They drive blood into a very organized laminar flow um, as opposed to like a turbulent flow, which is not, which would be considered a a more unhealthy version of of blood flow. And so it helps to maintain this flow pattern happening. Same thing also can happen in things like the lymph, right? Why doesn't the lymph have a pump? Well, because we've got this built-in mechanism to drive flow using exclusion zone water. Um, and and the proton wire. In other capacities, though, think of where protons are very much needed. And, you know, listen, this is going to, I think, go, I think a lot of people might be angry about this because I was taught, right, that like, okay, the only way we get protons into the mitochondrial intermembrane space is we eat food with, with hydrogen, right, protons. And we, we go through these really complex chains and, you know, we ultimately deliver those protons there. That's not, it, that cannot be the only way it happens, right? Uh, we've got thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of mitochondria in certain tissues. And we can't just be saying, I'm going to break down this carbohydrate. And, you know, we have to have another way to maintain the electron flow through the mitochondria and the proton buildup in the mitochondria, which is essential. And so because every protein leading up to the mitochondria, including the respiratory chain itself, is, is lined with exclusion zone water, it only makes sense that we've got a proton wire that can funnel those protons to maintain that inner membrane potential, right? A, a hydrogen buildup or a proton buildup there that drives ATP uh, uh, synthesis. And so I'm of the opinion that those protons are extremely important in mitochondrial health. They're important in maintaining things like um, the, the lysosomes, which can really help to degrade go- things, broken stuff inside of the cell. They're a really acidic environment. They need those protons. And so um, it, that exclusion zone water really dictates so much in terms of how the body operates at such a quick and, and, and instantaneous pace. And without it, makes sense, right? We're going to see dysfunction. And I think it's really why dysfunction is happening at such a a younger and younger age as well. You know, that's the canary in the coal mine for me. This is, I find this to be fundamental to human health. 
you know, we're talking about things that are absolutely key at that level of charge, electrons, protons, flow. Um, and now all of a sudden we've got kids who are indoors uh, with screens more than ever around Wi-Fi all the time. And so I think that is why um, we're, we're seeing more and more disease at a younger age. We used to, these kids used to have to build up to it. You know, you get to be 30, 40, you've, you've gotten enough toxins, right? You've acquired enough toxins through just natural living. Now we're going to see the dysfunction. And that's not happening anymore. We're just so disconnected from these fundamental sources and, and concepts. Um, kids are now just sicker than ever. Are you self-employed or a small business owner and are tired of paying hundreds of dollars a month to centralize health insurance companies for minimal coverage because there is no alternative? Well, I have good news for you. There is. And this podcast is brought to you by CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a more decentralized alternative to health insurance. And it uses community and crowdfunding to help its members pay for emergencies when they do happen. They incentivize and prioritize health and personal responsibility and share the thought that you should really only be using the centralized healthcare system when emergencies do happen. This is what I am on board with, and I have personally signed up for CrowdHealth since I left the corporate engineering world and the medical benefits that come with it. If you want to learn more, you can check out our episode with CEO and founder Andy Schoonover, or you can head over to joincrowdhealth.com and use code DRADIO, D-R-A-D-I-O, when you sign up to get a discounted rate of only $99 for the first three months. Centralized healthcare is one of the biggest issues in our society today, and I really love what CrowdHealth is doing to provide an alternative for people who care. Yeah, that's... That's an interesting perspective about kind of the proton chain supplying proton current maybe to the, the mitochondrial uh, membrane instead of just exclusively coming from, yeah, the breaking down of food and, and the cytochromes. That's – it makes sense to me because the way, you know, I've seen it and like I've seen it, you know, it's proton current that's flowing in the mitochondria, right? And and I have an electrical engineering background. So for me, this is like really easy to understand. I was like, wow, mm -hmm. this is amazing. And it's like, oh, we have this additional um, current supply coming perhaps now from from water, from the easy water that you're saying. And, and that makes total sense to me because it is really important to maintain uh, that mitochondrial membrane potential. And there's all these like functionalities that, you know, short circuit or, you know, the, the proton leak actually saves probably like the ATPAs from blowing up and, you know, mm -hmm. hyperpolarization. So I, I – I think that makes sense to me because there's just more complexity than we, we ever realize. And yeah, then it's not, again, just about the food story, just about, yeah, everything that's coming from, from the input of, you know, the TCA cycle, the Krebs cycle and, and things like that. But, um, what was I going to ask now? Um, I guess getting into that, you mentioned kind of is that the source of this super communication that's really fast? So, you know, I read about like jump conduction and this is happening via the, the proton tunneling in the chain. Is, is that why this is like such a fast process or is that yeah. the, on the electron side of things? I guess I just want to make sure no, it's clear it's, for it's, a, a listeners. That's a great question. Yeah. And, it, and, and I love your background, right? Cause you're going to get this right. There are no, like there are no particles, true particles, right? There are no one single protons, if you will. There, the, the, these are, these are, ener these are energetic waves. And so proton jump conduction, I think it's gotten this misnomer that it's like, okay, I'm going to eject a proton into here and it's going to push a proton out, right? Like we're talking about like billiard balls and that's how, you know, I, I add a proton here. And since it's all connected, this proton is going to get pushed here. We're really just, maintaining a flow, right? A, a, a positively charged flow, proticity, if you will, as opposed to electricity. And so um, it, it, it's going to power things like the, um, the fact that various enzymes have like these pockets where they need these, these protons in them to, 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 affect, to affect a biochemical reaction because those reactions take place. But we, these are the fundamental things that cause them to happen first. So I kind of have this view of the body. And this is what Maywan Ho called it. Like there, we're, we're always every subatomic, I'm going to say particle, it's not really, but every subatomic particle um, 
contains energy and information. So if we can view the proton wire as a proto neural network, right? It's another source of pushing energy and information throughout an entire system. If we can view the exclusion zone water and the electrons and the light, right, as energy and information, it only, it just makes sense that as if we deplete that, we're, and as we lose energy and information, what happens? Disease. We become energy, or thermodynamically or energy inefficient, right? We get, we, we start to store fat, we're obese, you know, overweight, obese. Um, and it really, to me, is as simple as maintaining that gelled water inside of us. It goes such a long way. It's so underrated. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. I just think it's so important to understand this, that this is not just like, okay, yeah, that's interesting. No, this is fundamental. Yeah, yeah. Just real quick. I think it's, yeah, it's complex. And I think it's a good point is to remember that, yeah, it's it's really traveling in, in waves and, and maintaining this flow. It's it's not this simplistic, just one part of it gets bounced out there. and one, It's this whole coherent system, right, which we can get into. But I'll let Ryan ask the question here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's interesting because I, I <clears throat> it it makes you think about water in like a completely different way too. Like actually, thinking about all these different tissues, you you kind of think about it in a different in a different format because it's just much more cohesive than you might have realized before. And everything is like you said, sort of connected in the sense. So I kind of wanted to ask you what the difference between um like how is the water in these like nanotubes like different than bulk water, and sort of what is bulk water. Sure. Well, you mentioned water nanotubes, which is actually a very unique way that water can organize itself even beyond exclusion zone. So water nanotubes are formed when you have a set number of collagen, um, collagen triple helices. So collagen forms a triple helix. When you have so many collagen triple helices together, they actually, which is what happens in our connective tissue, especially in our extracellular matrix. Um, when collagen forms that way, it forms tubes of water that are not membrane bound, which is just something, you know, traditional biological sciences would be like, what in the world are you talking about? But basically what forms are these interconnected, it's, it's water, it's this gelled water with the ability then that has, and this gelled water has a proton core, right? A proton wire core that just allows for even greater instantaneous communication. Why would the body form these water nanotubes um, unless it was really important? And what a water nanotube does is it provides um, things called like superfluidity, right? Meaning that that the water then can, the, the, in, the energy and information in those tubes, the electrons, the protons, the photons, maybe even phonons, right? Vibrations can flow instantaneously without resistance, right? There's no impedance whatsoever to the flow happening when water is in that, it's in a certain, it's in a certain diameter, it's nanometer diameter. And so again, this is just another way that we are able to communicate and create a, what, what Mei Wan Ho calls a quantum coherent organism, an organism where this part of my body knows what's happening in my eye, knows what's happening in the cells of my knee. How would that be if we had to diffuse a chemical? right? Okay. I'm going to give you a message, travel through the bloodstream. Oh, and you know, 30 minutes later, that's what's happening. It's just not the way it happens. And so these water nanotubes are really, really key for, for this instantaneous communication that I'm talking about. And it also makes sense why in things like, um, bioregulatory medicine, they, they've discovered interference fields, things that can block this communication, a scar, for example, can, can lead to certain symptoms. And what they're finding is that if we can alleviate that scar tissue, we can help that water nanotube reform and we can allow for that communication to happen again. And so sometimes disease or symptoms is simply a loss in communication, um, which by disrupting those water nanotubes. Yeah, it really is. It's crazy. It's almost like it's the interstate highway, the autobahn, like the bullet train version right. or, or or scene that this water is, is traveling through. But what's crazy to me is is how quick that, you know, the life of these things, like it's in, in nanoseconds. I think I have it written down here, like in the hydrogen bond lifetime in bulk water is like one nanoseconds, but in these nanotubes, it's like five, which is, yeah, I guess a big difference, but still it's like that's so instantaneous. Um, that's such a short lifetime. So to me, it's like these things are always reorganizing, reforming zones, uh, exclusion zones, and then also reforming coherence or, or becoming coherent. And, and that's what I kind of want to talk about next, because this is even, even more fascinating and, and it's different. But 
related to exclusion zone water and that's yeah the coherent domain water that yeah you know, they'll just say or whatever his yeah. name is um talks about so maybe you could shed some light there and then i want to get into you know that's kind of where maybe the the emf picture as well plays a role yeah it totally connects you're absolutely right so here's the deal right that um you know, probably sometime in the in the nine, uh, maybe mid nineties, um, two Italian researchers, Emilio Del Gurici and Giuliana Preparata, really started diving into how water behaves in this kind of nanotube form, and they termed the the behavior that they saw of water a coherent domain. And it looks like it appears as though exclusion zone water, especially in these nanotubes, is the same thing as this coherent domain. So you had a lot of researchers, actually. I could probably think of a handful of researchers who are kind of like, why is water weird? Like, why are why does water not behave typically how we would see it in a glass? And so what these Italian researchers called it was the coherent domain. And what they found was that the way that water was in that coherent domain, it was organized very much. They found they, they recognized there was a structure to that water. And that water in that state takes on a liquid crystalline capabilities. It takes on the capabilities of what we would call a liquid crystal, meaning um, the water is organized, right? Like we would see molecules in a crystal, it would be very organized, but it still has some dynamic capabilities like a liquid. And liquid crystals are very key property or have very key properties that make, I think, human life possible. They can trap electromagnetic fields, right? They can be an antenna for electromagnetic fields, meaning it appears as though the water inside of me in these coherent domains or just in the exclusion zone itself is continually trapping and sensing um, all of the frequency information in my environment that I can't sense with my eyes, my ears, touch, taste. Um, and it, and so if you think about it, right, it, we, of course we have to have a way to sense things like the Schumann resonance, to sense things like um, the freak, the earth, the, 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 um, the pulsing of the earth's magnetic field, geomagnetic field, which doesn't pulse very frequently, but like there is a slight pulse to it as well, a variation. And so, and then also all of the frequencies that are being generated inside of my body, like the, the heart to heart rhythm, that HRV, um, what the, the light that's being emitted or the infrared that's being generated by things like, uh, my mitochondria, we had to have a way to sense that and then do something with that information. And so the water, it turns out, is an antenna for the, all of that information, and it can trap it. And it can trap specific specific energy from that information and vibrate. And as it vibrates, that's a communication in and of itself, or it oscillate, vibrate. And it also can get energized that way. So you can actually energize a certain a certain molecule as it, the, the water around a certain molecule can trap it and vibrate. And that can provide activation energy for a biochemical reaction to take place. And think about what we, the information that we would have been around, right? A thousand years ago, it would have been bird song. Um, it would have been earth, the, the natural frequencies of, of the earth, of nature. And these days, billions upon billions of non-natural frequencies can penetrate straight through me, right? These are long wavelengths that can penetrate straight through me. And so if my water is continually sampling that, it can actually, under, we can understand why there might be a bit of disconnect or chaotic communication happening because it's just not a natural frequency that we would have been tuned to. But water in its liquid crystalline state takes on so many cool properties and, and that's just one of them. But it's really, really key to that, the concept of coherence and how we can operate in such a complex way. Yeah, I think this is, is really fascinating. And I, I've been researching a lot about EMFs and, you know, it's always like calcium gated channel or voltage gated calcium channels and oxidative stress but it's like no there's there's deeper mechanisms at play here and for me i it sounds like you're in agreement that this is probably like the main reason that non-native emfs are, are detrimental for our health um and i i found this like crazy and there's not a lot of research on this but i actually found a paper that was using emfs as like a, a treatment and it was very short duration and in the megahertz range of frequency i think but they talked about it affecting proton tunneling via altering H bond, you know, oscillation. And then I started reading Mei Wan Ho and and Del um, Juice's work, and to me, it makes total sense. And but it's it's kind of you need to put this bigger picture together. And I think you just painted that that it's like when these water molecules are are in coherence, they can emit and absorb EMFs, and then it's kind of like trapped in there when it is actually in 
full coherence and it's oscillating. But then when that's broken, it's also releasing that EMF. So to me, is this, I guess my question is, you know, why or is it the disruption of the coherence like the frequency that is the main issue here it's like that not enough water molecules are operating in this coherent state or is it the fact that it's just in general it's just you know altering the entire coherent domain i guess that might be the same question sorry it's 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 kind kind of confusing (laughs) no no it's a great question so you like tristan you said you have an electronics background like you know yeah Right. So, so picture this, right? Like you could have the, like the reason why we're so affected, I think, is you could have like the best, the coolest radio and antenna and amplifier and all, but, but if you don't ground a, an electronic communication system, there can be a lot of static on the line, right? You're not going to mm-hmm. get a really clear communication. So what I view non-native EMFs is it's static, right? The water inside of us is still picking up um, what's happening at that microscopic level of the cells and the, the heart, the blood flow, all of these, the magnetic flow of the, the, the blood, it's picking that up. But now there's just so much competition and static. And so there's a big lot of noise on the line, if you will. And the signal, I think, is getting diluted. And so when we earth and when we ground, not only do we talk about electron flow, we have to talk about getting rid of the noise. It's really another key aspect of earthing and grounding. And I think that's why I am such a huge proponent of it as, as a way to kind of mitigate not necessarily the damage from the calcium channels, right, of the non-native EMFs, but the quantum commun- miscommunication that can happen because of the added chaos, if you will, on the line. Yeah, I guess what I wanted to ask is, based on this paper and what I've seen is like the proton tunneling is affected. So yeah, is it really the disruption of the oscillation and frequency, which is leading to uh, diminished ability to proton tunnel and then yeah, just affected communication, I guess, yeah, it, but it's we, entirely don't, we don't pop. know. Yeah. We just don't know. No one's doing that research, right? I would love it. No one's doing that research in an ideal world. You know, this, this applied quantum biology um, becomes a, 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 an organization that can fund the research that I think we would all like to see that's not going to be funded in the mainstream yeah. routes um where i think we're a, a few years away from that um but but I, I, who knows but what what you know the, what we have to recognize is that as a proton as a as this proton wave this wire is oscillating right it's not only generating one frequency it generates harmonics we know that protons can do what's called second harmonic generation right they can combine and and that their combination of certain ones can either um, amplify a certain reaction here or they can combine and they can actually kind of diminish or cancel out other reactions here and so um, what I think is being, if, if you're disrupting that proton conduction, conduction, you're just disrupting that style of communication, the communication that relies on that the specific frequency or oscillation to reach a certain threshold. Um, and so, yeah, it, it makes perfect sense that not only do you, di- not only does non-native EMF actually physically diminish the exclusion zone, it also then has the ability to disrupt that kind of frequency communication, the resonance-based communication. That's, that's how the body operates, right? Is in that resonance-based communication. Are you interested in 100% grass-fed, grass-finished bison meat? I'm excited to be a partner with Falls Family Ranches. Based in Wyoming, Falls Family Ranches is raising high-quality bison meat the way nature intended. As a native large ruminant of North America, bison is one of the most nutrient-dense foods you can consume. If you're interested in trying out their bison boxes, use code TRISTAN, T-R-I-S-T-A-N, 10 for 10% off your first order. So I sort of have a question that's sort of along the lines of what we've been talking about, but it's a little more uh, generic, I guess. And so when I'm, when we're talking about like this oscillation and sort of like decreasing the uh, exclusion zone and stuff like that, I think about when I would fly a lot. Um, I used to travel to LA every month for work. And no matter what, every single time without fail, I would get for the whole first day flying out there, I would be like extremely dehydrated. I could drink endless amounts of water. My pee would be like still yellow um, for like that first day. And I I wanted to sort of get into like when we fly, like how that non-native EMF can like cause like dehydration because, and and, and I've always wondered like, am I even helping the hydration by drinking water? Because I think you might've seen this working with people is that, I mean, I know people that drink tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of water, but no matter what, they still feel dehydrated. And that's because, like, in my mind, I'm thinking, like, okay, well, the water 
in my cells different than the water I'm drinking. So like maybe I'm not even hydrating it. I'm like trying to conserve it, kind of create this band aid. But I'd love you to sort of explain that a little bit, like why that happens in the air uh, specifically. I know it goes along with everything we've been talking about, but I sure. just, I just find it really fascinating because this doesn't just happen to me. Like I I've, I've never had a problem drinking water on a flight, no matter how long the flight is, and then having to pee on the flight. I I can just no matter how much I drink, I just suck it up. Mm-hmm. So I sort of like to get into that for a second. Well, sure. I mean, especially, I would say, especially planes within the past five or 10 years um, are just non-native EMF microwaves, basically. Like it's, it's a less uh, concentrated version of a microwave oven. I don't want to depress people, but the re- the way a microwave oven heats the food is it vibrates the water molecules to the extent that some of the water molecules actually completely split or they generate tons of heat, right? So it's a very dehydrating way to heat the food and it, and it, and it jostles the water molecules that oscillates them. Right. So it's a very, it's a, <laughs> it's a chaos producing a, a way to heat, to heat the, the food based on the water molecules perspective. The same thing is happening to us. So not only are we um, like jostling those water molecules and dehydrating at to that capacity, but we're also then damaging the mitochondria. Non-native EMFs are inherently damaging to mitochondria. So we're not replenishing the water from the intracellular perspective. And I have found and, you know, this is just clinical observation. That I, there's not a ton of research. There's not going to be any research probably backing this up. But the water that we drink, I see, can help to maintain blood volume, can help to maintain that interstitial fluid, and then can structure itself in that interstitial space. But I do not believe that a ton of it really works to hydrate intracellularly. I believe true intracellular hydration happens from the mitochondria and the, all the water. There's so many hydrolysis react. There's so many water producing, water utilizing reactions that just continuously recycle themselves um, all throughout the, the intracellular space. And I feel like when there is dysfunction there, that is where intracellular hydration can take place. And you can drink, like you said, you can drink all day long, but the mitochondria have to recover some of their capacity in order to then start regenerating intracellular hydration for then you to start peeing clear again or, or light yellow, whatever it is, um, you're just not going to fully be able to, to hydrate just by drinking water alone. Hence why I've had clients who travel overseas a lot or travel a lot for work. They have to do more things like methylene blue. Like they have to do some really key mitochondrial support strategies that specifically key in on mitochondrial water production in order for them not to feel a very similar effect like you've, you've experienced in the past. Yeah, I think, I think people drink way too much water, to be honest, and and it's the not solving kind. the pr- yeah the wrong kind of water, and then it's not solving the inherent issue, which is yeah As I'm cellular. Water, guys. Cheer, yeah. Cheer. yeah, no, I mean we need some, but and and maybe we get into that because we've talked about you know some things of improving you know just in general function of this super communication highway, but then it comes down to also optimizing the production of metabolic water and. Yeah, what what are some of the best ways to do that? Because it's I'm assuming you know it's light, it's um, obviously being connected and having that that high redox, right? It's just mitochondrial function at 101. Right? It's mitochondrial function 101, right? And so what the additional supports beyond what we've talked about with the light, the earthing, mitigating the artificial crap light and the non-native EMFs. It then becomes, okay, what about red light therapy? Because red light therapy really keys in on the mitochondria in some key aspects. It improves both the water production and it improves the ATP production. So that can that can be very, very supportive. And one of my um, friends, like she's a member of my community, I mean, you know, colleague, she, I, I, I've uh, had a lovely, um, just, you know, we've just had a lovely relationship um, in this quantum space over the course of the past five years or so. Kelly Bento, she has been producing red light therapy panels that are actually even more intense than what, what the research would say, oh, that might, that might be too much red light therapy. And what I'm finding and what she is finding and other people using her lights are finding is that the body, most bodies are so starved for those red light frequencies. People can go way beyond now, obviously this is not advice for anyone, but you can, you can experiment with going beyond the traditional recommendation of 
cut it off at 20 minutes. I, I think that red, I think the mitochondria just really soak all of that red light in and it can get distributed. We can carry that red light through our bloodstream as well. And that we can have systemic effects. So even if you shine it on your shins, it's been shown to have systemic effects on things like mental health um, and pain in other areas of the body. So red light's another one, I, you know, methylene blue. I, I have clients use it strategically for sure. Right. Absolutely. I think it's an important thing that, that can, we can throw into the mix. Um, we've done, we've done a lot of podcasts on methylene blue. So I think, yeah, so you got that one down, right. Yeah. That's, that's great. That's wonderful. Um, I also, you know, I, I've, I have clients who do things like Brown's gas. Uh, they swear by Brown's gas, which is a form of molecular hydrogen, right? That you can, that you can breathe, that you can inhale. Um, yeah, I, and you know, at some point there are people who have so much buildup of toxins, whether it's mycotoxins, whether it's heavy metals, whether it's just a really bogged down liver. And so they're burdened by chemical toxins and all of those things can impact the mitochondria and the water production. That's when you go to what does strategic support look like there? right? You know, what are the things that you can do? So there are some strategic detoxification support, but I really find that if people jump right to that detox, I want to do this detox protocol, this parasite protocol, this, um, you know, this heavy metal protocol, I feel like it overburdens an already electron depleted system. And it ultimately can make people feel a heck of a lot worse. So that's uh, sort of, this goes way back to the beginning of the podcast, but it just popped into my head because I see it in the space a lot. And it seems to be a real like scare for people is like you're mentioning uh, at the very beginning, you mentioned redox before detox. Right. And in the space right now, what seems to be the popular discussion, at least in the space I'm in, I'm, I'm probably in like an echo chamber, but it's they talk a lot about mold toxicity and how mold exacerbates heavy metals, which is exacerbated by non native EMF and all this stuff. And I think all those things are like good to talk about. And I think they're important because I do think a lot of people deal with these problems. But it goes back to me to the question of, okay, why are you susceptible to these issues? And no one's talking about the redox part of it because there are places in the world, South America, um, Central America, super humid, lots of mold around, and you don't see people with these issues necessarily in the same way you see it in maybe Northern European people that now live in the United States or whatever. And there are so many, like, I can't remember what the percentage of homes that are like water damage is like, pretty high it's like or whatever, or something, 80. Yeah, something it's like that. Really high. But, but it makes me wonder, it's like, okay, why are we seeing these problems now highly exacerbated? And I feel like we're going about it wrong because there's like, I love Shoemaker. I love that protocol. I think it's great. I think all these things about detox are cool, but they're missing that light component. So how we've actually, I mean, I don't even really need to go into it too much. I just want to make that statement because all the things we're talking about here, I think play a critical role in not only making those issues better, but mm -hmm. preventing them from coming back, which I think is an issue that no one really talks about either because you have everyone moving to a new home, moving to drier states, um, yeah. just the avoidance strategy, which is important, but it doesn't create health. Right. It's sort of like when we right. talk about carnivore, we did a, a live about how um, fat can like, make more ATP, all this stuff and all these various things. I think doing those things can be a great therapy but is it a sign of health that you have to eat only meat to feel good and you can't have X, Y, Z? And I've never thought that that was the case. To me, everything has been a Band-Aid, even if it works. But yep. then we sort of like end the story with, oh, we feel better now. We don't need to explore why any of this was going on. We'll blame any nutrients or something like that. And I think this sort of connects that gap. And I think water is such an important discussion within that that maybe doesn't have enough attention uh, with, with that space. And so I don't know if you had anything else to add on oh, that yeah. topic as well, because I just think that this, <laughs> this for me, cause I have so little, little short blip about me. I had like mercury issues from eating tons of tuna and stuff. Um, I lived in a water damaged apartment that flooded several times while I lived there. And that's when I started getting sick, but I never connected the fact that I was surrounded by like tech all the time. I worked on a computer constantly, was always indoors, never went outside. Um, if I did, I was wearing like tons of clothes. I was very afraid of the sun. Um, there's obviously the food component into that, but I never connected the light or the water or any of that stuff till later. And I was one of those people, like I mentioned earlier, that was so chronically dehydrated. I was drinking water all the time and nothing changed until I started looking at this stuff. So I'll let you kind of rant on it now, but I just, yeah. I just think it's so cool because I really want to drive it home for people that you got to look at this stuff. It's like, it's to me, it's non-negotiable. Like mm -hmm. if you're, if you're ignoring this, I don't even want to talk about the other stuff. 
because we're not going to get yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I feel the same way. I feel like this is the foundation, right? So this is why I've partnered with the, the you know, Institute of Applied Quantum Biology to offer a certification program for practitioners, because I'm not saying if you're uh, an expert in the Shoemaker protocol or Morley's, you know, RCP protocol, or like, if you're not, an, if you're an expert in those, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying we need to lay a firmer foundation. And so as a clinician, my favorite thing in the world is to have a client come to me with a crazy mycotoxin or mold sensitivities or something along those lines. And typically it's a constellation, right? Of lots of histamine related stuff. So sometimes it's Lyme, sometimes, you know, sometimes it's just MCAS. And you have to lay the foundation of let's get your light right. Let's get your timing mechanism in your body. Your body doesn't know how to repair if it doesn't know the time that it needs to repair, that's nighttime, right? So let's set that foundation. Let's get you hydrated, meaning you have to get outside. You have to touch the earth. You have to get the natural infrared on your skin. Ultraviolet on your skin can also be a way to support charge and redox and electricity. So I find I feel like electrons and redox and hydration and the water, those go hand in hand. And when we when I do that, guess what? When we truly reestablish this water in the body and the timing mechanism, dehydration. Do you want to know what exacerbates histamine reactions? Dehydration. We've no, actually a, a doctor in the eighties found that out a long time ago. It's, it's completely been ignored, but if someone is chronically dehydrated and nowadays it's that intracellular hydration, like you talked about, Ryan, like drinking water all day long. But if your mitochondria are damaged to the extent that they're not making it for you, you're going to have histamine issues. And so, yeah, I could throw a ton of DAO at you um, to, to degrade histamine, right? Or I could give you something like quercetin to try, but that's a band-aid. And so I lay these foundations to say, okay, now you come to me with this symptom burden assessment. You know, I've got an assessment of 300, your scores are 300. Now that we've laid this foundation, your symptom burden is now 120, right? That's a great improvement. I'm not saying this person still doesn't have some symptoms, but now we've pinpointed what might need additional support? Oh, looks like maybe chemical issues, phase one, phase two. Oh, looks like maybe connective tissue is still potentially an issue for you. Let's get you with the red light therapy. Let's talk maybe about proteolytic enzymes and things like that. So uh, maybe it's a mineral issue, right? So let's try to talk about some balancing there. But like, if I'm not laying this foundation, I'm just kind of like throwing a dart at the dartboard and being like, let's try this, let's try this, let's try this. And so it feels like really good to lay this foundation for clients first. And I've seen significant changes happen in three days in terms of people who have been on this healing journey for 10 years. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. And, you know, you mentioned other things like sleep and, yeah, melatonin just being so imperative for, for mitochondrial function. And, yeah, it's it's really simple, but I think it's the fact that you kind of had to change your whole lifestyle, your whole paradigm in order to achieve this, that it's really challenging for people. But, you know, it's literally free to do this, to go outside more, to connect with the earth more, to have a regular bedtime and, and eating schedule. And, yeah, you don't need – all these supplements, they can be helpful, but they're supplemental. Remember people. So it, it sounds so wild, right? Just to be like, no, just go, just be a human, right? Be a, be a human. That would be, we'd be mm -hmm. living outside, be in constant contact. And even these beautiful strategies of like traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda, they were developed when people couldn't help, but be connected all the time to the earth under natural light all the time, have a strong circadian rhythm. So I'm saying like, we have to just lay this foundation of being a human again. And then maybe see some additional support strategies. And it, it's crazy how far we've come that this is kind of like a wild, maybe, or this is considered like woo. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, wait a second, like we, how far have we gone in the opposite direction that this is now considered kind of out there to like say, get outside and touch the earth with bare feet. Yeah. So I guess talking about Ayurveda and, you know, things like acupuncture, acupressure, and, and maybe just regular like foam rolling, like where do those play a role in this? Because that's all rel related to meridians and then fascia and this whole matrix, right? Yeah. They're, and they're great. All those that you mentioned, you know, acupuncture, acupressure, foam rolling, myofascial release, all of those are great because those do tend to the water network in our body, right? The meridian system really truly is in those, I'm going to say that I'm going to tell you they're in those water nanotubes, right? Um, I, th there's one research paper out there that I, that agrees with me on that, um, that actually studied this. And so, but, but, so if we can do those modalities, that's, that's great. We can tend to this communication superhighway, but 
if we're flowing electrons and protons and reestablishing that communication, but the timing is off, our circadian signaling is off, then, okay, great. Now I've got electron flow and proton flow, but I'm not necessarily, I'm not, I, there's still chaos at that timing level. And so it all goes hand in hand and it's, it's, they're beautiful support modalities, but I'm, you can foam roll up the wazoo, but if you're staring, if you're do, if you're doing shift work or you're staring at a, you know, a, a phone screen late, late into the night, it, it's only going to go so far. That's, that's a good point. Cause I've actually thought about because I've tried these like modalities and I find that they help like in like massage therapy. You talk about that sometimes um, that helps like in the moment or like for a little bit of time after, and you're sort of working on these knots and you're sort of making these connections for water again by like sort of acupressure or whatever, or even something like uh, I've done dry needling, which is basically just acupuncture with electronic stimulation. And they always explain it to me as we're creating micro traumas to increase blood flow. And I think that's part of it, but I think it's more so we're creating these connections again, but it's like if you don't do this stuff, you're not going to maintain the, 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 the fix. And so that's why I think it starts to dwindle back. You get back into the same activity, the same environment. And that's why I think your environment at the end of the day is going to be king. I wanted to ask you just really briefly, and maybe we can kind of be short on this one because I don't think – I think we've covered a lot. But it's just like when it comes to – we talk about collagen or the matrix or all these different like connective tissues. But – when we're assessing the quality of our own collagen, what are some things that we can look for to sort of assess like how, like how our collagen is functioning currently? Like obviously we have all these symptoms and stuff like that, but like, does it look different? Like under the microscope, like how can we assess changes in it um, to know where we're at? It's a great question. Um, so one of the things that is a really good indication, clinical indicator of connective tissue um, dehydration, if you will, is stiffness tissue stiffness. And so, or if you have immobility in a certain area, you're not producing that fluid, this hyaluronic acid water holder, if you will, it holds the water in the connective tissue. And so tissue stiffness, nagging injuries to me is another one. That's a symptom that you've got some communication, um, some, some fibrotic tissue in there, some, some cross-linked collagen pain. Um, I think chronic pain is another indicator for me, either of dehydration in general, and that, so that not necessarily the connective tissue, dehydration in general, or, um, or it can be more specific to the connective tissue. Uh, and think about, I mean, like think about as someone ages, as someone ages, dehydration goes hand in hand, right? We hear a newborn is 90% water. We hear, and you know, someone in their geriatric years is now 55%. And all of a sudden this person is like, I'm stiff. I'm in pain all the time. I can't move my joints in the same way. And so if we can just do these strategies to help maintain this water, we can really maintain a youthful communication and also a healthy feeling body as well into old age. I don't think that, you know, aging is a, is a sentence where you just have to accept, you know, that your body just feel is going to feel like garbage all the time. And so, but those are really um, clinical indicators for me that we have to attend to someone's connective tissue scars as well, right? Some pretty obvious scars, whether it's a C-section, a gallbladder, an appendix um, scars are something that I like to address as well uh, because that can really also block this communication and dehydrate certain areas of the body. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like water to me is one of the most important aspects, if not the, in our biology, it seems, right? And mm -hmm. what you just said, that's why kids are also more susceptible to non-native EMFs. And yeah, this has been a great overview. So just last rapid fire question here, Carrie, what's something that like you're extremely excited about that you're researching or that's kind of on the frontiers, you think kind of the next breakthrough that we're going to really connect the dots on? or you are going to connect the dots on maybe. And this um, can be really short. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, I feel like I'm, re I, I, my re I'm researching so much, but what I really do love is the concept of, of vibration and frequency and the fact that the body really operates at that scale. I think there's a lot of promising, and I hate to say technologies out there, but it's going to be these technologies that get people to recognize, oh, that's what nature does for me for free. Mm -hmm. A lot like red light therapy, right? Like, oh, that's what nature gives me for free. These days, people need a technology, sadly. And I do feel like we're coming such a long way in this concept of how we can almost tune the body back to health. And legitimately, there is a, you know, a tuning fork method to do that, where we can tune the body back to health using vibrational information. Um, fascinating to me. Fascinating stuff to me. It's almost like homeopathy 2.0. <laughs> I think it's totally true to me as well. I mean, you just learn it's like, you know, the water molecules are oscillating, aromatic amino acids, the mitochondria are oscillating, like 
but yeah, we might not get these, yeah, the research of science unless it's like a, a modality. And that's why it's funny. The one paper I found out about this is actually like using EMF as a treatment. So, you know, right. they, they could be right. Like if it's the right frequency and it's, you know, not 48 hours of Wi-Fi blasting you, it's yeah. just an hour. Who knows? Totally. So thank well, I mean, you. There's a, yeah. I hate to say oh, this I'll let you go. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you're right. There's a hormetic reaction, right? Like that. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And you're right. That's why I think it's going to be a technology that gives us this information because got to Someone wants to make money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, that's what needs to happen. But we'll take the science that we I'll get out of the that. I'll take the science. That's right. Know? Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Carrie, for coming on. And yeah, where can people find more about you and your work and everything? Education. Well, thanks so much for having me. I've I've been so enjoyed this conversation. We got to dive down some really cool holes with this. But um, so my hub is Instagram, Carrie B Wellness, where I try to post about this type of stuff in bite size ways, although it, it can get intense. Um, and then my, my website is carriebewellness.com. You can see my options for online courses that I've taught, uh, how to join my membership community, uh, my practitioner mentorship, my, the certification I was seeing, all that is on, uh, as a hub on my website, carriebewellness.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on and, and thanks everyone for listening to another episode of Decentralized Radio. We'll see you next time.